last programme in the series of Our Island Heritage, we'd reached the stage of the, the, the Celtic races, and we were in fact talking about the, uh, the Craft of Man crucifix. We welcome back Mr. Marshall Cubbon, who is the director of the Manx Museum and National Trust, and uh, I suppose perhaps just a brief thought about the end of our last programme before we move into the next era. Yes, well, we were, we were talking about this outstanding carving that was found on the Calf of Man, uh, showing the crucifixion. Um, and it would be just about the time when that was being carved, um, perhaps about the year 800 or so, um, that Viking longships appeared here in the Irish Sea Basin. Um, we know of the first appearance of the Vikings really from Irish records, um, but we know they were harrying and plundering all the coastlands of Western Europe, and uh, I'm sure the Isle of Man got, got its share mm. too, although there was no actual Manx evidence of the, of the raiding period. Mm. Uh, but the Isle of Man, of course, later became very rich in, in, in Viking antiquities, and uh, this case that we're looking at here is actually related to a Viking ship burial that was uh, excavated um, by Dr. Gerhard Berso, the German archaeologist who was working here at, during the last war, um, at Chapel Hill, Balladool, just mm. to the west of Castletown. Um, on the top of the low hill there, um, it's in fact a very rich site in terms of archaeology with um, all sorts of different periods uh, represented. Um, but there, Dr. Berso did discover traces of a um, Viking period ship. Uh, he got iron clinch nails. They were rusty, of course, but they were still clearly recognizable. The timber of the vessel that had been lying in the earth for over a thousand years had decayed away, but the uh, clinch nails were there. And with typical Teutonic thoroughness, he plotted the position of every nail, and from this it was possible to work out at least approximately the size of the vessel, which was about 35 feet long. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, within the limits of the vessel, there were the remains of um, both a male and a female skeleton, and uh, many fine objects that obviously had been buried in the ship with the dead warrior. Yeah. Uh, this burial dates really from the second half of the ninth century, or even just a little bit later, say from about 850 through to 910 or some yeah. dates of about that. The, I think most people sort of think of uh, Vikings as being the raiders who came and plundered and left, but they obviously they, they started to, to settle and intermingle with the, with, with the Celtic people around about this time, did they? Yes, this is true. Um, they, they settled here in Man. It was, uh, they, they, it was mostly the Norwegian Vikings that uh, affected us here. I'm not saying there wouldn't be the odd Dane or the odd Swede mm. too, but uh, it was mostly the Norwegian sailing west westwards uh, to the Shetlands and the Orkneys and then down through the western Isles of Scotland into the Irish Sea Basin uh, that uh, affected this uh, part of uh, Britain. And uh, as you say, they, they later settled here, they carved out farmsteads for themselves, um, apparently uh, intermarried with the local Celtic population. and. Um, uh, but uh, they, of course, all came from Scandinavia, which um, was still a pagan country. The Isle of Man, of course, and the Celtic inhabitants here had been Christian for centuries before the arrival of the Vikings. But uh, the Vikings um, uh, still clung to the pagan religion of their Scandinavian homeland, and when they died, they were buried according to the custom of that religion. And hence, here at Balladool, uh, you have an instance of, of a ship burial. I think on this other case you have here, the uh, at Balatir, there's um, interesting proof that they did, and in, in fact, when a warrior was buried, there, there was a sacrifice, uh, usually a maiden um, sacrificed with him. Well, I don't know about the word usually, but sometimes anyway. Uh, the, the, I mentioned at Balladool there was there was a, a, a female skeleton as well as a male skeleton within the within the boat, and it would be a bit fortuitous if she died at just the right moment. Mm. Uh, but. Um, uh, 
the excavation at uh, Balatir in Jerby, uh, this was not a ship burial, it was actually a coffin burial underneath a pagan Viking mound. Um, when this mound was excavated, the Viking himself was buried in a wooden coffin in a grave pit underneath the original ground, dug into the original ground surface, and he had his sword and his spears and his shield and so on all buried with him. Um, the grave pit was then filled up, a memorial mound of swords was raised over the grave, um, and near the top of that memorial mound there was a layer of cremated animal bone, um, obviously a sacrifice of the Vikings' livestock. There was cattle and horse and sheep and pig and dog. And also there was the ex uh, extended skeleton of a young woman, and the back of her skull, as you see here in the case, uh, had been cut away with a blow from a sharp implement, perhaps this very sword that uh, had been buried with the with the dead warrior. Um, this is quite definitely evidence of um, of sacrifice associated with a pagan Viking burial. Um, this had been known from an interesting. Uh, Arabic uh, account, actually, of about the same sort of period, early 10th century, um, of, of Vikings in the east of Europe. Um, but when this particular skull was excavated, it was the first positive anatomical evidence that existed anywhere uh, to prove this point. More recently, a Norwegian university excavation in the western Isles of Scotland have got similar evidence. So it does seem to have been, I don't know about usual, but at least a not, a, not unusual yeah. <laughs> custom. Yeah. And one other thing I noticed too, that the, the actual sword here and, and other specimens you have are, are distinctly broken in, in sort of three places. Why would this mm. be? Well, the sword here at Balatir um, is in its scabbard, I may say, which in itself is, is remarkable. Very few Viking sword scabbards are, 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 have been recovered anywhere. Uh, the, sc the sword in its scabbard had been deliberately broken before it had been placed in the grave. From the position of the three pieces of sword in the grave, it was quite clear that th this had not fractured from any slumping within the grave or anything of that kind. Uh, the sword had been broken and laid in the grave in a broken state. Um, well, there's perhaps two, two explanations, uh, um, perhaps a bit of both, I would fancy. Mm -hmm. Firstly, um, this may have been some kind of ritual killing of the sword, so that um, just as the, the, the dead warrior went on to Valhalla and so on, uh, the sword was, was, was killed and, and, and could go on with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I suspect that there may well have been a, a, a quite practical reason too. It, it, it was uh, uh, perhaps done so that everybody would know that the sword had been damaged beyond repair and therefore it wouldn't be worth the fellows coming over the hill one dark night to dig up the grave of grandfather in order to get the fine sword that was, was buried there. It is a fine sword, as you see, and the, the lovely silver inlay on the, on the handle. This was actually clean for us in the research laboratory at the British Museum, with a nice little diamond pattern of silver wire inlaid into a copper sheathing of the guard. A very fine weapon indeed. We mentioned earlier about Vikings, the, the raiding and the plundering, but would this sort of give the impression possibly that they were fairly wealthy people of their time with uh, as regards silver and uh, things that they had sort of uh, stolen on their raids? Um, well, I suppose the uh, if they if it was a suc successful raid, they would be wealthy. <laughs> um, but uh, Viking silver is is not at all un unknown in in the Isle of Man, and and over a dozen uh, hordes of silver coinage in particular, and some of them with uh, ornaments as well, have been found in, in the island. Uh, this case here deals with the, the, the Douglas treasure hoard, which I suppose is the largest uh, hoard to have been uncovered. It was actually discovered when the foundations of a house were being dug in Derby Road back in the 1890s. Um, but I think a, a point I really must stress is that um, we all tend to think of the Vikings as um, raiders and, and, and plunderers, as indeed they were, but they were also fi very uh, fine traders. Uh, the 
Viking trade was just as important as as uh, as the raiding and plundering, and after the period of uh, the sacking and and and, and raiding, um, there was a, a century and more of extensive trade. Uh, trade routes were really established from I mean, talking about our part of the of the world, from from Norway down through the coastlands of Europe to. Uh, Moorish Spain and, 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 and the Mediterranean. And um, these hordes of, of coinage that have been found in the island really uh, should be viewed as evidence of, uh, of this trading activity. Yeah. I, I think the Vikings have had a, a, a rather bad press, if I may say so, because the people who were, as it were, writing the press of the, about the Vikings were the Christian monks mm -hmm. of the periods and uh, the Vikings tended to make a beeline for the for the Celtic monasteries and the other Christian monasteries mm -hmm. because they knew there was a lot of wealth there yeah. and uh, it would be so rather a biased report absolutely <laughs> yes <laughs> well I do want to talk obviously about the the, the formation of Tinwolf from the kingdom of the uh, man in the Isles but I think the the runic crosses just very briefly before we move on to that yes I should indeed like to mention the runic crosses mm -hmm. the, the the Vikings when they when they were converted to Christianity, which seemed to uh, happen quite quickly, uh, perhaps after one or the most two generations, um, they readopted the earlier Celtic Christian practice mm. of putting up carved crosses on the graves of the dead, but the decoration of those crosses um, incorporated all sorts of scenes and ornament from the Scandinavian world. Mm. And you get a lot of animal ornament, there are keen on this, uh, a lot of interlacing developed in their own particular style, and also little scenes um, f from Norse mythology and from, from uh, the, the legends of the Vikings, Thor and Odin and, the, and Loki and the, the, the Norse gods uh, appear on some of our Manx crosses. And um, uh, the story of Sigurd, the great warrior who roasted the dragon's heart and so on. Uh, this appears uh, clearly shown on uh, on the crosses in the island. I, I like the way here you, you've managed to sort of bring out in highlight um, the particular piece you want to illustrate. Well, yes, we, we've, uh, most of the original crosses are preserved at their respective parish churches mm -hmm. under the guardianship of the Manx Museum, and here we have a display of latex casts, full-scale latex casts, and uh, we have picked out some of the scenes in, in, in white mm -hmm. uh, paint just to draw attention to them, because this is the kind of thing that the crosses are full of interest, but uh, the ordinary everyday person has a job to recognize the, these mm -hmm. features because you, you've got to get your eye in before you can really, really see them. So we've attempted to uh, um, make it a little easier for, for, for the general public in this way. And I suppose really that there could be a, a few more that, that haven't been sort of found yet that could add to uh, the, the, this historical part of the, the museum. Well, this, this is true. We're, we're always on the lookout and we always are very anxious to hear about from anyone who, who's come across a stone with curious scratches or carvings on it, uh, that, that they, some of the scratches could very well be a, p a part of an inscription in the runic alphabet that was used by the, the Norsemen. Yeah, you don't mind how many false alarms you have, you'd rather have hundreds no, to, to get one genuine that, one. That, that's very true, yes, yes. We hadn't had one for over 30 years and then two turned up a couple of years ago in the, in the same year. Well one question we haven't gone into and possibly this is the time to, to ask it now is about the, the, the government um, formed, you know, the, what, what do we know about Viking government in any way? Well, the one word answer, of course, is Tinwald. Mm. Uh, the, word, the, the very name is, is a Viking name, um, meaning assembly field. It's from the old Norse thing, Vala, meaning assembly field. And um, the Tinwald Parliamentary Assembly was, of course, established by the Viking settlers here in Man. It seems to have been quite a feature of uh, the Norse Viking colonies um, throughout um, many different areas where, where they settled, the, the Northern Isles and Iceland and so on, as well as here in Man. Um, just precisely when a Tinwald organization was set up, we do not have any firm written records. 
um, of course it is Iceland that uh, uh, competes with us as, as to which of us is the older uh, parliamentary assembly. I think the position is that Iceland has an older written record, but um, the director of the National Museum in Iceland has admitted to me that we, the Isle of Man, have evidence of an earlier Norse Viking settlement. So I think it's at least a debatable point as yes. to whether or not we're the older. Mm. Th there was, of course, the kingdom um, Man and the Isles, and this is where it Tinwald sort of came from. Yes, it? yes. The the the, the Tinwald uh, mm. probably in its early uh, phases, mm. each little uh, Norse colony might have had its own small Tinwald, mm. but eventually a kingdom, a maritime kingdom, based basically, of course, on the dominance of the Viking longship mm. on, on on the seas of this part of. Europe, um, a kingdom was established that embraced all the Western Isles of Scotland as well as man. This was known as the Sudriar in Old Norse, the Southern Isles, as distinct from the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shetland, which formed a separate kingdom. And we have here on, uh, in the Viking Gallery at the Manx Museum a, a map showing the extent of the, the Southern Isles, the kingdom of man and the Isles. Um, and um, from this you can see the area where representatives of the original Tinwald were drawn. Um, the Isle of Man was the most important island of this kingdom, um, not only because it was the most fertile, but also it had its strategic position in the middle of the Irish Sea Basin. And we see its importance really in the makeup of the original Tinwald back in the Middle Ages. The island of Lewis and its smaller islands sent four representatives to Tinwald. Sky sent four, Mull sent four, Isla sent four, that made sixteen in all and the Island of Man sent 16. So Man provided half the total. Then later on in the um, 12th century, uh, the islands of Mull and Isla were lost to Somerled, the Thane of Argyll, who was strong enough to seize the islands from the King of Man at that time. And this reduced the makeup of the composition of uh, uh, Tinwald. We were still getting four representatives from Lewis, four from Skye, and 16 from Man, making 24. And that's why this almost mystical number of 24, uh, the makeup of the keys, uh, still survives to the present time. Of course, they all come from the Isle of Man <laughs> now, um, and not many Manxmen, I think, realise the, uh, the the background to this this figure of 24. But it is, in fact, uh, the cut down of the original 32 from the loss of Mull and Isla. So, Man always had the most, and now they, they've got them all. <laughs> now they've got them all. That's right. <laughs> Well, I think it would be fair to say now that we've jumped a, a fair period in history and come to perhaps more modern times in the in the folk life gallery. Yes, uh, here in the, in the basement folk life galleries of the museum, um, we are really trying to present a picture of the traditional pattern of life in the Isle of Man. And um, I'll ask my colleague, Mr. Walter Clark, of the museum staff, to uh, talk to you ab about these galleries. Fine, thank you. Well, uh, Walter, nice to welcome you back to Manx Radio. Nice to be here. Yeah. Um, the reconstructions are a very important part. Would you like to sort of tell us uh, uh, about them and how you've gone about sort of getting them in, mm. in the wonderful condition they are? Well, yes, we, we sort of emphasise the reconstruction type of display down here as opposed to the straightforward case display. Mm. Uh, it has been a bit of a slog. We had to go out and get the materials. For instance, the little dairy over there, um, we rebuilt that ourselves mm. here. We have very little outside help. And uh, as you'll see, this, the flags on the floor, they're all solid Manx slate. They eventually, believe it or not, came from a pigsty out in the yeah. north of the island. Yeah. I had to go out and get them. Mm. The bink came from another little cottage. That's the stone uh, bench there, which the milk was put on. Mm. The cheese press, that came from Kirk Michael. All these things have been contributed by people all over the island. And we try and give a little picture of what it was like and the conditions under which the people lived and worked in this mm. particular period. Yeah. Well certainly I think they make a, a tremendous asset to the to the museum and um, I think we have over here now a, another one which is typically of the the Manx, the, the white brick and the thatched uh, roof isn't it? The sort of cobblestone buildings with mm. the thatch and the old woods again. Yeah. Uh, of course in the old days it would be straw rope not the, the kind yeah. of which the people made and this is a little fisherman shed, a reconstruction of a fisherman shed. 
the type of material here is not sort of suitable for case display, but mm. in this sort of background it does project itself, and you can see that it's something which is used by a fisherman. When the weather's too bad to go out, yeah. he goes to a shed and he mends his lines and his nets, gets his gear all in order, and this is all the sort of clutter which would be accumulated by yeah. a, a fisherman. The remarkable thing about of Mall is the size of the windows. They were very, very small. Very windows. small. The people hated fresh air and light in the old days, and unfortunately they suffered through their health because of that. Mm. But, um, it was a typical feature of Manx Scott. And, of course, there was tax on the windows, too, at one time. Of course, they would well, save the money, the smaller the better. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, one of your largest here, perhaps, Walter, is the, um, the, the barn. This really does look um, lived in, as if uh, they've just gone home for a bite to eat. Well, it? that's it, exactly. Yes, that's the impression we want to convey. Mm. We, as the cobblestones came from the point of air, and we set to in the wintertime, and we reconstructed this and built it with the horsehair mortar, mortar with horsehair in mm. it as it would be traditionally mm. and um, all these, uh, the implements you can see here came from all the various places, the uh, the hay cart there came from uh, the top of Selby Glen and uh, they've all been given by people. Mm. But that, that really is very impressive isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yes, the children, particularly the children, the visitors from, from the cities and things mm. like that, they really appreciate it because they, they read about these things but mm. they, they never see them. To actually see it mm. makes the difference. And in its sort of natural setting too, yeah. it's, a, it's a great thing. Mm. And I think if we just walk across here we can virtually look in the, what is the general store oh, window? The little shop, yes, yes we had fun with this because mm. this is built of sandstone. We try also in here to try and illustrate the different types of building material. Mm. In the west of the island you get the sandstone, the red sandstone. In the north, of course, is the cobblestones in the barn mm. and the various types of stone. And uh, when the demolition was going on in the various towns, we, we noted various pieces like this window and the door and things, and we kept our eye on them. And when the houses were pulled down, we asked the people for them, and they very generously gave them to yeah, us. So that the actual sort of correct period as oh, well. Oh, yes, mm. these are absolutely from the various houses and buildings in the, in the parts of the island that's been knocked down doing yeah. the, the sort yeah. of and the, the even the things you've got on the, in the window the, the old braces and, oh, yes, uh, and yes. various things these yeah. are uh, again authentic aren't absolutely. they absolutely yes yes they came from various old shops mm. and the counter came from peel the little scales yeah. and inside we have other scales and things obviously mm. we have to keep it off from the public yes. because if they get inside mm. it would uh, create havoc but yeah. uh, it's very interesting, really. So the, the next move, obviously, from the, the shop would be to the farmhouse. So if so. we can yes. um, just through. sort of go through and uh, talk about it, perhaps, as we're on our way. I think this is w the very first reconstruction ever carried it out, is. and yes. I'm pretty certain the Manx people all really know about this one. Oh, gosh, yes. It's one of the most popular in the summertime. We have queues the whole length of this gallery trying to get in. Yeah. At one stage, we did give them little talks on it, but we had to stop that because uh, as people came out, others came in, and we just couldn't get away from it, you see. Mm. And but again, uh, th was this, um, as I say, this was the original, this has really given the idea for all the others, has it? Oh, it had, yes, yes. This was the start, or this was the starting uh, reconstruction, and it's more or less authentic in detail to uh, a Cortland-type farm cottage, you know, the, the larger farmhouse with the big wide-open chollock mm -hmm. or fireplace, the slowry, or the iron, adjustable iron pot holder with the turf fire, of course, and the in the hearth and the spinning wheel on the hearth which was a sort of uh, a feature of the Manx way of life. Yeah. As I said Walter this was the original um, sort of reconstruction. W when was this first uh, reconstructed? Uh, 1937 this, mm. was, uh, this was done and uh, it was pre-war but uh, they did, made an excellent job of mm. it and uh, and it's, well, it stood the test of time. It's still one of the most popular things we have in the museum. Yeah. Do, do you find now that you're uh, even finding things to, to perhaps add to this? And, of course, we mustn't forget the, the little bedroom oh here yes. as well. Uh, yes. Uh, well, stuff is coming in all the time, and we're being offered stuff all the time. Unfortunately, due to the lack of storage space here, we have to uh, refuse some of the stuff, mm. or we have to be very careful as to what we accept rather than uh, choose it, I should say. Mm. Um, Storage space is very difficult, uh, and time, of course, to get on with the things. Yeah. One thing that I notice here, the um, the grandfather clock there, still ticking away. Oh yes, keeps excellent time. Yes, mm. it's wonderful. That that's one of the Moncaster clocks, and it's it really is great. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You, you must find a tremendous amount of sort of self-satisfaction being so keen on the, the Manx way of life, as I, as I know you are, and I'm sure many mm. people do, to be able to be involved in this sort of reconstruction here. Yes, it, it's. I get a lot of satisfaction out of it, and particularly out of the um, 
well, the obvious pleasure that the visitors get when they mm. come here, they, they, they really do enjoy it. You know, yeah. it's one of the most popular galleries in the museum mm. and they, they really enjoy it. It's yeah. great. Do, do you see uh, any other reconstructions sort of in the future or not? Oh, I would like to very mm. much. Um, a short while ago we went out to Selby uh, on a, a tip-off. We always get these yeah. information on tip-offs. And uh, we discovered out there a complete little tailor shop, absolutely complete as it, as, as it was, as it has been used, uh, unused for about 40 or 50 years, uh, complete with the raised bench, the, the um, sewing machine, his boards, the goose and the tailor's goose of course and all the various other bits and pieces and we are very fortunate that we removed the whole lot complete and uh, if time will allow and space will allow we, we can reconstruct yet another little feature of Meng's life yeah, in the gallery. So that, that could be the next one? I hope so, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Well, now having moved out of the lower gallery, we've come to uh, another folk life gallery, which um, is more in the traditional case display, Walter, isn't it? It is, yes, yes. Here you get more exhibits put together in a small space where the people can note the variety of... Um, uh, well, each person who made an implement had his own ideas, and you get the nice little variations, like in the straw case over there, that illustrates the use of straw over here, all the various again twisters, all a different shape, all doing the same job, but quite different and, yeah. and quite fascinating, really. Yeah. I noticed, too, you mentioned um, the, the, this... The slowries. Oh, yeah. yes. You, yes. you couldn't perhaps see them all that clearly in the kitchen of the you farmhouse, can't, so no, you can see them no, all there. You can, yes, and you can see some of them are chain-made, some are rope-made, some mm. are solid iron, but they all have their adjustments and their all have their little differences which is which makes it more fascinating and the mining of course too this mining, was another important part wasn't it it was indeed yes but we have very little um, implements at all connected with the mining of course except the little helmet mm. there or hat with its daub of clay and candle and, mm. and the various uh, fuses made of straw etc another use of straw yes mm. and uh, wood of course which is um oh yes a lot of treenware over mm. here and the little um, butter prints you see up there. We have over 60 altogether in our collection. Mm. Each farm, each little croft that produced butter had their own um, pattern mm. for the butter, which was their trademark, and, and they were very proud of it. Beautifully, beautifully carved and uh, very nicely done. Mm. So all in all, it's a very interesting part that uh, obviously you get a lot of enjoyment out of. Oh, yes, indeed, yes, yes. Plenty to see, plenty to look at, and plenty to keep you occupied. Yeah. Walter, thank you very much. A pleasure. Mm.